Welcome to another episode of We Don't Die. I'm your host, Sandra Champlain, author of the number one international best-selling book called We Don't Die, A Skeptic's Discovery of Life After Death. And today on the show, we have Pat Johnson, who had a kayaking trip that changed his life forever. Over the last many years, Pat has been an active member of the Central Texas International Association for Near-Death Studies, also known as IANS. Pat is also one of the founding members and organizers of the upcoming Wisdom of the Near-Death Experience, a symposium that is being held March 23rd through 25th in Austin, Texas. You can find out more, and I'm sure we're going to be talking about it on the show, at neardeathwisdom.com. Pat's passion and focus today is sharing the lessons he learned from his near-death experience and showing that anyone can access these messages and make them a part of their lives. A warm welcome. I want to say, Pat Johnson, welcome to We Don't Die Radio. Thanks, Sandra. Appreciate it. Uh, You're very kind. I'm thrilled that you're here. One of the things my listeners like most is guests that um, have had some near-death experiences and might not have been pleasurable for you at the time, but I know that your words can really impact so many. So thank you for being our guest. Oh, you you bet. And, and, uh, you know, I love the opportunity to share um, not not necessarily my story of my NDE, but I love the opportunity to share the, the lessons and the messages that I received and and uh, what it's meant to me in my life and what what I hope it can bring to other people's lives. Yeah, it's great. We can live vicariously through others' experiences so often and, and get the message. So why don't you tell your story? There, you, You're in Texas, I know, a <laughs> big state. Right, right. Well, uh, I live on uh, the Blanco River. It's a river that uh, uh, flows in central Texas in the hill country. Uh, uh, I'm located... Uh, between Austin and San Antonio, and uh, I kayak. Uh, I usually go up a uh, river about oh eight or ten miles and kayak back to my house, and and that's my typical trip. And occasionally I'll go um, south of my house and go downstream, which is a a longer trip, uh, maybe eighteen miles or twenty miles. And um, I hadn't done it in a long time, and so. I had a friend that was working at the South Pole at the time, and he had called me, and, I was, uh, and, and uh, you know, we always watch for the river conditions to be right. And it just so happened when he called me this week uh, that we had had some rain and the river was up and flowing really fast, so that was when we liked to go. So I asked him, I said, uh, his name is Bobby Humphrey, childhood friend of mine. I asked Bobby to come up and spend the weekend with me and take the longer trip. And uh, he came up, and he's he's just a great outdoorsman and travel and adventured all over the world so he's a perfect partner for for a kayaking trip and we started out this uh it was a sunday morning september 12 2010 and the river was up probably about two feet over normal so um you know if you're an adventurer and you like the thrill of the big rapids that's a good time to go so we had it out and uh beautiful day you know crystal clear skies with little white puffy puffy clouds and uh, about two thirds of the way into the trip, we're crossing a low water crossing, and um, <clears throat> I uh, I hit the uh, the top of the bridge, and it turned my kayak sideways, and I dropped off my kayak, and uh, the water was real calm on the surface, so uh, I was didn't suspect anything other than that I'd just drop off the kayak and then swim over to shallow water and get back in the kayak and continue on with the trip. And uh, as I went into the water, I got about uh, not quite waist deep, and uh, it just felt like uh, the jolly green giant had reached up and grabbed me by the ankles and yanked me under the water. And um, at this point, I knew I was getting sucked into something. Uh, a few years prior to this, I was in a uh, near a low water crossing, and there was a washout under the bridge that was a natural washout. And I'd gotten a leg, my leg sucked into this washout, which was a small hole. And, um, you know, I just bruised and <clears throat> scraped my leg, but, uh, you know, no, no damage. And, but, but I was aware of these washouts being under, under these bridges. And so that's what I thought was happening. I thought I was getting washed into one of these, these washouts. And, um, there's nothing I could do. I mean, obviously when, when you get that much pull, against you, you know, you can't swim against it or fight it. The only thing I could hope for was that my, my feet would 
um, hit a s- solid surface and I'd be able to pull my way out of it or walk my way out of it. Um, you know, since I'm at this point, I'm completely submerged underwater. Mm-hmm. And, um, about that time I feel these bumps on the tops of my hands and I recognize it immediately. I was being, I was being, uh, I'd been sucked into a corrugated pipe underneath this bridge that, that I was unaware of it being there. And, um, I was able to, to push my hands up and push my feet down and I was able to stop myself inside the pipe. And, uh, I looked over my shoulder and it was total darkness behind me. So, um, and, and I'd grown up, uh, you know, shooting through these pipes as a kid and a teenager. And, and, uh, when we would do it, we'd typically run an inner tube through there and we never went through a pipe that didn't have an airspace in it. And this one was completely submerged, but, uh, what you'll find in some of these pipes is you'll find an obstruction from either rocks or, or, uh, metal post or branches, barbed wire, that sort of thing that gets sucked into these pipes and gets stuck in there. And so I knew that, that if I let go and I went through the pipe and there was an obstruction on the other end that, you know, that'd be it, you know, that I wouldn't be able to make it out. So, um, I felt like my only hope was going forward the way I came in and I was probably about, um, 10 or 12 feet into the pipe. And so, uh, I just started pushing with everything I had. I was making these little tiny steps, probably two to four inches at a time. I was moving forward. Uh, because of the pressure on the water was, you know, was so, so strong against my body. And, uh, as I'm in there, <clears throat> all of, um, my instinct or all of my senses were, were, you know, just heightened just incredibly. I could, I felt like I could feel every drop of water going across my body. I felt like I could see every, every little tiny speck of, uh, d- dust or dirt that, that, passed by me in the water Um, you know I could hear every sound and I just started pushing forward and and you know at that time all I could think about was was just surviving and I was thinking about my wife and kids and I was praying and that was it you know it's just just down to the very the the very most basic thoughts or the very most basic parts of your of your core and um, you know so I'm pushing forward I make it to the end of the pipe. The the bridge had about eight in, uh, about eight or ten inches of water across the top of it. it. Was flowing across the top of the bridge at the time, and so I made it to the end of the pipe, and I was able to get my hands on the outside of the pipe, and I was trying to pull my, push myself out of the pipe. But at the at the front of the pipe, the water was stronger, and I couldn't get any part of my body. I couldn't get my head out. I couldn't get my shoulder out. Uh, the only thing I was able to get out of the pipe was just my arm. And so I'm trying to figure out, you know, what I need to do to, to, you know, get myself out of that pipe. And about this time, uh, the pipe is probably three or four feet under the water. And about this time, I see my friend, Bobby, his hand reaching down through the water towards me. Uh, the water was, was murky because it had been flooding that week, but it was, it wasn't, it wasn't totally, uh, uh, you know, it wasn't so dirty that you mm-hmm. couldn't see. There was probably, there was probably about, oh, six feet of decent visibility and then cloudy visibility after that. Uh, so I reach up and I grab Bobby's hand and, uh, I always tell people that when I grab Bobby's hand, there's, there's nothing that replaces the feel of the touch of another human being. I mean, when I, when I, touched Bobby's hand, you know, it just gave me hope and it, um, you know, I knew I wasn't alone. And so he was on his hands and knees on top of the bridge and hanging on with one hand and on his knees and reaching down with the other hand, grabbed his hand. And I thought, oh, this is all I need, you know, just that little extra pull and I'm out of here. So I, I pushed up as hard as I could and pulled on Bobby's hand at the same time. And when I did that, our hands came apart. I lost grasp with Bobby's hand and our hands, uh, separated. And, and when that happened, I lost my grip with my other hand and I got pushed back into the pipe a second mm-hmm. time. Wow. And this time I didn't go back into the pipe quite as far. I was probably only about six feet into the pipe the, the second time. And I started pushing forward again because I knew I could make it to the front of the pipe. I already did it once. 
but uh, my concern was is I'd been underwater for a long time at this point. And I didn't know how much longer I could hold my breath. And uh, I started pushing forward, and I, I made it about maybe maybe a couple of feet. <clears throat> and all of a sudden, uh, I just I just felt like like I was encapsulated. I, I just felt like a bubble uh, surrounded me, and 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 everything. The water just seemed to be in slow motion. It wasn't hazy like I was blacking out. It was it was very. I had a very conscious thought of it, and it was very clear. But the the sound got quieter. I didn't. It's like I didn't even feel the water touching my skin. And just in that moment, I knew that everything was where it was supposed to be. Everything was right with the world, and there was nothing to worry about. That everything would be taken care of, and I just was overwhelmed with the sense of peace. And in just a moment, <clears throat> there was no fading. It was just a. It was just a. Uh, in a in an instant, like turning off a light switch, I went from conscious to unconscious as far as the physical part goes. Not not the not the not the spiritual or not the consciousness, but but the physical, uh, you know, body went unconscious. <clears throat> and when that happened, um, my immediate thought was, well, first of all, I went to a different place. And the place that I went to, I felt like I was kind of in a, uh, like a hallway, but not quite like a hallway. Some, like, like maybe a combination of a hallway and a, and a cave because the floor, uh, was like black marble. It was just like a shiny black, black marble. And to the left of me and overhead of me, uh, there was a wall, but it was, it was, it was kind of rigid, uh, like you'd see on the wall of a cave. But it was it was it was soft. It was like covered with felt or velvet, but it was black, just black. And off to the right of me, it was just openness. It was uh, it was just like it was endless darkness, and, and it was it was such a darkness. It was a kind of darkness that you could stick your hand out to and and lose sight of your hand. It was that kind of dark. And in front of me, <clears throat> at a distance of. If I had to guess, it felt like it was maybe 60 or 70 yards in front of me. There was what what looked like a uh, blue stained glass window with a hole in it, but not a round hole. It was a hole, in, a hole like if somebody had thrown a rock through a piece of glass, and behind it was this bright, bright white light. It was a white light, and and it kind of had the it kind of looked like a kaleidoscope because the, it was it was dimming and and brightening, you know, and, and, and it was changing patterns a bit. And the, and it, and the, the edges of the broken glass, it, it, that's the only way I can describe it, had rays of light coming off of it, which were reflecting off the floor and shining on the walls. Mm. But, my, but my, my immediate sense, this is what I saw, but my immediate sense was is immediately I felt connected to an indescribable number of souls, and I don't know how how I know that I just know it. And my first thought and my consciousness, was the same there as it is here. And my first thought was, is man, you got to be bad to not get to come here because I felt like I was where I was supposed to be. And I just knew there was multitudes of souls with me. And I, I didn't feel like I'd been that good a person. But I felt like I was there, where I, you know, where we're where we're supposed to go when we mm-hmm. leave this place. And the second, the second thought that I had, or the second um, feeling that I got, or awareness that I got, was I felt like my kids and my wife would be walking. I felt like I could look over my shoulder, and my kids and my wife would be walking in right behind me. And I think that might be something to do with our distortion of time, you know, yeah. between here and there. But I, I may, and, and I've thought about it many times, and I think maybe that's part of the peace that I had because sure. um, if I live, if I leave them thirty, forty years in terms of what we know as time on Earth, would maybe only be a like a snap of a finger, you know, on the other side. I don't yes. know, but uh, that's what I that's what I felt. I felt no connection to my body. I just felt. Relax, relaxation like I've never felt before. 
I had my consciousness and I, I was, I had my awareness, but you know, even as relaxed as we get here on earth, you know, we can still feel our clothes touching us or maybe even air touching us. But there, there was, it was just total relaxation with, with no hurts or aches or just no sense of a body. And I wanted to get towards, I wanted to get to the light. I was, I was wanting to get to the light as quick as I could, but I was being drawn to the light just gradually drawn to the light, not at, not at my speed. It was just, uh, you know, and I'm sure most people, um, can relate to this. It's kind of like in a dream where, where you're being pulled along slowly and you don't have control of, of your movement. And that's what it was like. And as I got closer to the, as I got closer to the light, uh, what was giving the light, the kaleidoscope effect, were there were people walking back and forth in front of the light, very calmly walking left to right, right to left, at different angles. And I was getting closer to them, but the light was so bright behind them, all I could see was silhouettes. And I could never recognize any of the people. I wanted to, I wanted to see who they were, but I never got recognition of who they were. And as I approached the light and I got closer to the people, and I, you know, I felt this overwhelming love, and an acceptance i i woke up and when i woke up i was staring at the water and it was i was i was on you know these rocks were below me and there was a maybe four or five inches of water covering the rocks and i was going towards the rocks and being pulled back away from the rocks and the the, the first sense that i had when i came to was what had happened was is uh, when I lost consciousness, there wasn't anything in the pipe. And I got pushed out of the pipe and pushed down the river through the rapids. And my, my friend was with me, was able to jump off the bridge and catch up to me about 75 yards down the, down the river from the bridge. And he was able to pull me out of the rapids, uh, into the shallow part of the water. And he didn't know how to do CPR. So he rolled me over on his, on my stomach. And uh, he said when he got to me, my face was was a grayish purple and my eyes were open, fixed, wide open. But, you know, I wasn't breathing. And when he got me to the shallow part of the water, he rolled me over on his on my stomach. And he straddled me from behind and put his uh, arms around me about uh, my lower part of my chest and the upper part of my stomach. And he just started raising me up and down. And uh, that's all he knew to do. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and he was in shock at the time and, um, it, it worked, it, it, it worked, you know, it, 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 uh, worked as far as, um, you know, the act of a C, of doing CPR. Yes. So it, it resuscitated me. That's the word I'm looking for. It resuscitated me. And so when I came to, he's pulling me up and down immediately again. The first thing I feel is a touch of his hands around me and his arms around me. That's the first thing that I sensed. And same, same as, as when he touched my hand when mm-hmm. I was in that pipe. Nothing replaces the touch of another human being. And the next sense that I felt was the air touching my face. That I, I just, I could feel it just talking to, describing it right now. I can, I can feel it like it was just happened a minute ago. This nice, cool breeze touching my skin. And, uh, then I realized, you know, what was going on. And I pulled my knees up under me and I put, pulled my hands up under me to, to steady myself. And when I did that, it took the, the pressure off of, uh, Bobby's arms and hands. And, uh, and he just rolled me over and he grabbed me and started hugging me and kissing me and telling me he loved me. And then he started yelling and screaming at me and cussing me out. And <laughs> this went back and forth, you know, for three or four minutes before he could settle himself down and he was crying. Sure. And, uh, he was, he was actually in worse shape than I was in. He was, he was, he was in shock and, and that's been a few years back. And to this day, it's hard for him to talk about mm-hmm. it, but, um, you know, that's he scary. felt like he, he was, yeah, he felt like he was going to be, um, coming back to my house and having to give my wife the news that I died that day. And right. that's all he could think about when he was trying to resuscitate me. So anyways, very traumatic for, for him. Sure. And, uh, you know, and, and we're very, we've been very close our whole lives, but we're even closer now. But when I came to, 
and after Bobby uh, had had recovered, I crawled up on a bank, and I, I laid on my back, and I was just looking up at the sky, trying to get myself together after I finished coughing up water, and uh, every every muscle in my body was fatigued and was was hurting, and and my my chest was hurting. I could bear, I could just take these tiny little breaths. And then my head was was just pounding. It felt like somebody had hit me in the head with a baseball bat. I had a terrible headache. But I remember laying there on my back and looking up at the sky. It was like the first time I'd ever seen the sky. I couldn't, uh, you know, I'd never seen a sky so beautiful. And I was just laid there in amazement. It was just this baby blue color with these little white puffy clouds like little balls of cotton going floating across the sky. And, and all the clouds seemed to be illuminated. There almost seemed to be a light inside of each cloud. And I, I was just, I could, yeah, I could feel the clouds. Uh, I, you know, I, I just I had a feeling that I couldn't describe. And um, I was able to lay there for a few minutes and I was just thinking to myself how, you know, I've never seen a sky that beautiful before. And uh, after five or ten minutes, I, I had to get myself back together because we're out in the middle of nowhere and we're, an hour and 45 minute float still away from, from a vehicle. And, uh, you know, there's no roads. It's, it's out, oh you know, it's just out in the middle of nowhere and there's no houses, nothing. So I have to get back in the kayak and continue on with the trip. And, uh, I'd lost my paddle. And so the, fortunately these paddles that you kayak with, they, they come apart in the middle. So we, took Bobby's paddle and, and, uh, he took half of it and I took half of it and we continued on and, um, we finally ran across my paddle, you know, not, not long after we gotten started. But, um, one of the turning points for me, or maybe the turning point for me was, um, probably about 20 minutes down river. I'm trying to take all this in. And as I'm going down the river, uh, you know, just the strangest things are happening to me. I, I felt like I could feel the trees. I felt like they were, I could, I, I felt like they were a part of me. I felt like the, the rocks, the grass, everything. I could just feel, I just felt connected to, to everything that, that was around me. And, um, about 20 minutes into the, into the, uh, float, uh, you know, after, after this had happened, um, this white egret, uh, flew from the in front of us from the left side of the river over to the right side of the river and landed in this big cypress tree and it looked like it was it was illuminated it looked like it had a uh, a haze around it that was that was that had light attached to it and and it landed in that tree and just sat there it was just glowing and i knew i knew in that moment that that my life was changed forever I knew that things would never be the same. Oh God, I'm getting choked up thinking about it. I knew that things would never be the same after that point. And I asked God to, you know, whenever I talked about this story, I asked God to let it be his story and for me to be true to it and not to ever change anything and let it to be, you know, for his service and his will and not mine. And, you know, I, I prayed that. And then I looked at my friend Bobby and I told him, I said, man, you're going to think I'm crazy. You're going to think this is really nuts, but I'm, I'm glad this happened to me. And I said, I can't explain it, Bobby, but man, I went to this place. It was just beyond description. It was fabulous. And I can't describe the feeling I have right now. And, um, you know, I'm really glad that this happened to me. And so... Anyway, we made it back, you know, we made the rest of the float and got back in our truck and loaded up our kayaks and came home and, and, um, you know, my wife was waiting on us and she could tell something was up. And so I walked to the bedroom and Bobby stayed in the kitchen with her and Bobby started crying again and tell her, told her that, that I almost died. And then she came in there and, you know, when we hugged and, uh, and she's, She's fantastic. She's been very understanding. And, uh, you know, because when you do have a near-death experience, a lot of things happen that uh, that continue to happen to you even after the experience. You know, you have different insights and you have different views on things. 
and uh, you know you have a different sense of truth and reality. Sure. Maybe, maybe not a different sense of it, but maybe a, maybe more of an aware, awareness of it. Yeah. Uh, Some people are different it. people, you know, to their spouses and families and things. It can be a real adjustment. Yeah, yeah, I know. I know like a couple of weeks after this happened, there was, um, you know, people would come up to me and say, oh, I heard what happened. You know, man, I'm just so glad you're okay. And uh, I guess, you know, you're so lucky. I guess it just wasn't your time and things like that. After a couple of weeks, I, I looked at my wife one day and I said, Man, honey, don't take this the wrong way. But when people come up to me and tell me that stuff, I, I just want to, I just want to tell them, you know, yeah, I am lucky. But if I wouldn't have come back, it would have been okay. I was in such a beautiful place. It, right. it was, it would have been okay, you know. So, and um, you know, I mean, we, you know, when you're here on Earth, it's it, that's not our choice, you know. When we we go and when we're called. And in the meantime, you know, we, um, you know, we do what we are sent here to do to, to, to learn and to teach and, and to be tempered and to, and to de- be prepared for that next, for that next, uh, part of, of our existence. And, um, anyway, there's times when, um, you know, as a near death experiencer that, uh, you get confused, especially especially in the early years for near deathers. Uh, you get confused, and you're you're searching for a purpose, and and it can be frustrating and create a lot of anxiety. And um, in in my in my life, uh, I finally finally came to the realization that uh, you know that our purposes are in front of us every day. We just have to be aware of them and take take advantage of the opportunities. And, uh, you know, what we think is, what we think is important and what we think is, you know, that we have to have this grand purpose, you know, uh, saving a starving nation or curing cancer or something like that. Those are things that, that are on our terms. But, uh, the reality of it is, is that in God's terms, uh, maybe something as simple as, as, you know, hugging a kid that, that, doesn't have a, a a parent or or uh, you know going and visiting with a, a shut-in neighbor that uh, is isolated. I mean, you know, sure. uh, our our the the reality of it is is there's no act of kindness or love uh, that is too small or that is more important than another one. They're all important, you know. So we just we just have to. Um, I think come to terms with with that that we're we're all important and we can find purpose in in everything that we do in our jobs and taking care of our family and uh, socializing with our friends and neighbors. You know, uh, there there there's a there's a purpose to all of it, and mm-hmm. we just have to we just have to be aware of that. And 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 when those and when those times come along that we are able to 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 touch another person's soul or to encourage another person we have to be we have to be ready and willing to to be there for them yeah i I keep hearing in my mind simple things matter they absolutely they absolutely do and and simple things are not simple things Mm -mm. you don't you don't know where it ends i mean you know you could um you know, you could encourage in a small way. Just give give somebody a uh, you know a loving touch or a sign that you see them and they're valued, and they can take that and pass that on to another person and pass it on to another person, or they can hold it the rest of their life and 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 um, you know use it for motivation and inspiration to to do to do good things as long as they're here on earth and. You don't know where that's going to take them, or where that where that where that act that you think is simple or small right. will end up. It can you have know? a ripple effect on many many other people. Absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Pat, it, it has a life of it has a life of its own. Do you still, or did you still, after the fact, see the world with the new eyes, with things kind of illuminating and um, like feeling connected to trees and things like that? Did that continue? Did you end up going back to 
Well, I tell you, I, I tell you that the strange, one of the strangest things that happened mm-hmm. to me was uh, when I and when I went into a restaurant or a crowded room or uh, any place that there were people for the first couple of months, I felt like I, I, I could. It wasn't that I visibly saw their souls, but people's souls, people that were around me. Their souls were almost tangible to me. I felt like I could reach out and and actually grasp your soul. It was I I, I don't I just had a sense of everybody's inner soul that was around me. Um, Incredible. The level of noise uh-huh. was reduced, and I could I could distinguish multiple conversations at one time. Um, I. I could see, and what was what was really neat about it too, is when I when I had that sense that I could see and feel people's souls, uh, it took all the judgment away from from the way I looked at people. I I I, I was able to look at people the way God looks at people, the way He values people. It's for their soul. It has nothing to do with how smart they are, what how they pretty like. they are, yeah. what clothes they have on what their job is, their education, nothing. We're, and the sense that I got was that in God's book, everybody is important, and he desperately wants everybody. And and so it almost got to be a joke to me. I would see somebody pull up in a, <laughs> in a big four-wheel drive jacked-up truck and strut out of it, and I would just snicker. And I would see some little old lady shuffling down the street that, that may be considered uh, low on social status, mm-hmm. uh, and she shined to me. So, uh, you know, and, and I will say that over time that faded, you know. Uh, I mean, I, could, I, I can still get pieces of that, but n- not like it was when it, when it first happened, you know. For the first couple of months, it was just, it was just, it was like looking at, uh, it was just like looking at another person, almost like a shadow. I would say. It's so when I would see somebody. Cool, just uh, thinking of you know. I always end this show saying that we're souls having a human experience, but I think one of the deals with being human is that we don't remember who we really are, and that experience to you, it just like you came back being that soul. So you're recognizing other souls. You're seeing the beauty. You're seeing the. Uh, egret illuminated, being one with the clouds and the trees, and you know that's all available. Well, I think to all of us. Yeah, and the, and point. you know the messages, the message of this, the messages that stuck with me. Uh, first and foremost, uh, I had this message that we're overthinking things. Just love God and love each other, and everything is going to take care of itself. It was that simple. It was that simple. It wasn't this long, drawn out, you know, floating through the stars through the ages or anything like that. It was just like it was just like you're overthinking, th- not you're overthinking things. It was we're overthinking right. things. Love God, love each other, and everything else will take care of itself. One of the other insights that that was just almost as strong was the connectedness. And when you're talking about, you know, we don't see our, our souls while we're here on Earth. <laughs> I got this overwhelming sense that, and, and I could see it when I could see the souls, is that we're all interconnected. And uh, I was talking about it to this this one lady that was in our uh, near death support group, and she was an elderly lady that had had an, an NDE back in the I think in the late fifties. And I I described that to her, and she just kind of chuckled and she said, "Yeah, it's like that rug right there on the floor." That rug is that rug is is an individual rug, but it's made up of thousands of threads. The threads are all bound together, but they each individually keep their identity. But they're all bound together to make up the rug. Oh, that's great! And that's the way our souls are. We're all we're all touching each other, and we don't see it. That's why it's so important to realize, you know, your actions towards people. The way you the way you react or the way you treat one person affects affects everybody. It ripples through it ripples through the souls and it touches all of us, negative or positive. So when you 
when you do something to make somebody feel better, it may it can make lots of people feel better. If you do something to make somebody feel bad, it can make it can make other people feel bad. You're not just affecting that one person. And we're affecting you know, ourselves too. We're affecting ourselves. Sure. Yeah, for sure. So, you know, it's uh it's just, you know, like I said, it's a, it's a life changer. It 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 changes the way you look at ev- everything and and especially for me it it changed the way I look at people more than anything. Pat, how did you get involved with IANS? Well, when I came back, uh, when I had the experience, I was, gosh, let me think. I guess I was 53 at the time. I'm 60 now, and this was seven or eight years ago. It was mm-hmm. in 2010. And, um, you know, I had just a, I was, I was scared. I was, I was um, anxious because I was seeing things differently. And, I mean, come on, you know, you're, you're just having a good time and you're working and taking care of your family one day and the next day you think you see people's souls. Mm-hmm. I mean, come on, that just doesn't happen, you know. Yeah, a little weird. Yeah. And, right. No, it was it was it was strange and it was it was scaring me. And I didn't know what else and there were some other things that were changing for me also. And uh I told my my wife uh, a couple of weeks after this happened, I said, you know, I gotta talk to somebody and I said, I don't want to talk to a psychiatrist, I don't want to talk to a, a counselor. I got to find somebody that this has happened to, and, and specifically, I'd like to find somebody that's drowned. And so I started looking on the internet, and I found IONS, the International Association of Near Death Studies, and I contacted their their office in uh, Durham, North Carolina, and they put me in touch with uh, the local chapter. And at the time, uh, there was a guy named Ed Salisbury, and he he still runs the group that was running the group, and. Uh, and they gave my phone number to Ed, and a couple of days after I'd contacted him, Ed gave me a call, and I felt an immediate co- connection with him because he understood what I was talking about. I couldn't, mm-hmm. I, my family or friends didn't understand what I was what I was trying to tell them. They they couldn't relate to it. But as soon as I got on the phone with Ed, within five minutes of talking to him, uh, I just connected with him immediately. He understood what I was talking about, and my my stress and my anxiety was gone almost immediately. You know, he just ex- explained to me that there was going to be some other changes that were going to happen, that it takes a while to integrate all these things into your life, and that it's all good and not to worry. And that that's all I needed to hear. And from that point on, I was fine. So um, they they had a bi-monthly or a meeting once every two months here, in uh, Austin, and I, I just live about 30 miles from Austin, so uh, I started going to the meetings, and and uh, I was in a group of other near-death experiencers, and and it's it's just a great support group. You know, they understand what you're talking about. You feel at home. Uh, you go out and you uh, deal with the world as it is, and and every every month or two, you can go over there and be amongst friends that. Or have, having the same um, dealing with the same uh, things, and and you talk to them, and, and you feel like you're at home, and then you recharge your batteries, and then you go out there and you do it again. Um, and speaking of recharging batteries, um, one of the things that I found very helpful for me is um, I call it meditative prayer. When I can get up in the morning and just be very very still and very quiet and pray, and then after I pray, just be very still and meditate and just try to open my mind and my heart and listen for answers. And that that has given me, uh, that's given me the closest thing that I've found to my NDE. That's the strongest connection I have. Can you walk us Uh, through that again, what you do? I usually get up in the morning Mm -hmm. early before my wife is up. And all our kids are grown, so we, we don't have kids in the house. Oh, and I hear you have 16 and, grandchildren? <laughs> oh. Yeah, i got 16 grandchildren. Oh, my we got goodness. Like, we've got a, lot, got a lot of people around here, but, yeah. uh, you know, not just my wife and I live here, mm-hmm. fortunately. You know, so we don't have to, at our age, we don't have to deal with Diapers. 16 screaming kids all mm-hmm. the time. But uh, anyway, I get up early in the morning before she does. I like to come in. i got a chair that I like to sit in. I like to leave the lights off. I want it as quiet as possible, and I just bow my head and I pray, and I pray until until I'm done praying. 
It might take five minutes. It might take ten minutes. Whatever I want to, whatever I want to share with God, whatever I want to ask God about or tell Him, I do. And then, um, and then I like to sit still for five or ten minutes and just listen. And it's amazing to me how often, when there's something that's troubling me, that it's you know, and I don't hear a voice. It's you know, people say, "Oh, God spoke to me." Well, I've never heard a voice, even in my <laughs> ND. I didn't hear a voice. Mm-hmm. You just know, and you know, and and um, answers come sometimes, and sometimes they don't come, but it always puts me at peace. So maybe that is the answer. Maybe just the peace is the answer. And that you just know? knowing, yeah. Yeah, and it's just just the stillness of it. Yeah. And, um, you know, and then um, I, I have to say, since we're on the subject, one thing that has distressed me a bit is, um, you know, I, I've met a lot of people over the last few years that are interested or involved in the, in the near-death experience. And um, a, a lot of people that I that I've met that have not had a near-death experience but are interested in it, there seems to be, uh, you know, they, they read a lot, they theorize a lot, they're looking for answers, scientific proof, and, um, you know, they talk about it a lot. And, and I think all those things are great. I think, you know, in my opinion, you know, your, your prayer is part of your spiritual life, your your study and your and your search is part of your spiritual life. But one thing that I, that I see that's, uh, and I think it's the third leg of it, is, is, just, is just living, going out in the world and living mm-hmm. and, and sharing and serving and loving and being loved, you know, the contact with other people. And sometimes I see uh, the NDE movement with a lot of study and research and and reading and writing and contemplation, but um, I I think we also have to we also have to take the lessons that we learned from the NDE and act on them. Also, I don't think you know when we talk about unconditional love and, and we talk about uh, you know the love that we felt on the other side. I think that that we we have to share that love, and I think. I think the love can be dead if we're not if we're we're not touching people with it and we're not sharing it with people. Mm-hmm. And when I say sharing it with people, I mean actively getting out in your community and your in your environment wherever you might live and 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 you know giving that word of encouragement to somebody that that that's down on their luck or is having a troubled time. You know, uh, sharing a laugh with somebody. Uh, you know, going, stopping by and visiting somebody that you hadn't seen in a while. You know, I, I think the, I think we learn from each other and we're teaching each other, and that is part of the that's part of the journey that 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 sometimes we don't get involved with as much as we should. Uh, you know, uh, where we where we help each other and others help us. You know, and yeah. and on a, on a personal level. I, I agree with oh. you. I've heard it said in so many different ways that service is the coin of spirit. You know, just any act of making a difference for another person means more and, and I, than anything. I, I, yeah, yeah, I agree. And I, and I think we underestimate ourselves in that respect. I think, I think just acknowledging somebody, just saying, I see you, you know, mm-hmm. you're valued. You know, and and there's many different ways that you can do that. You know, just a just a kind smile, a thank you. Uh, let me get that door for you. So so many ways that we can do it every day, all the time. You know, and and those are the things that that lift our spirits, and and, and we can give it for free. It doesn't cost us anything. We you know we can every time practically any time you turn around. You can you can make a po- you can have a positive effect sure, on some sure. on somebody. Back to simple things matter. I'm not going to write that book, but I just think <laughs> not, I mean the, the the tiniest things can just make the biggest impact. Oh. Well, let's yeah, go ab- now to absolutely. the impact that you're having because there's something coming up next month that I definitely want to talk about. Um, my listeners, Pat, hear me talk about 
an afterlife symposium that happens in Scottsdale, Arizona every September. But there's another symposium, which is called the Wisdom, a Wisdom of the Near Death Experience that's happening March 23rd through 25th, 2018 in Austin, Texas. And I definitely want to invite people to that and wondering if you could share a bit about what that is and how that came together and um, what people can find there. Sure, sure, it's a Sandra. Big deal. Well, three years ago, uh, three, four years ago, our, our small group of um, experiencers were sitting around and, and uh, we wanted to make um, our message or the, the messages of the NDE more available and a little more widespread, you know, to the public just here locally. So we put together a, just a small event, one day event, and we had speakers that came in that were researchers and near death experiencers and, and, uh, people that had written books. And, uh, it was, it was primarily a, a pretty much a local event that with, with local speakers. And the first year we had it, uh, you know, we had right at a hundred people. So we were, we were happy. And we wanted to make the event uh, affordable, and, and we wanted to have some social interaction with it, mm-hmm. too. So anyway, we kind of made it a fun deal where not only you got to hear these presentations, but then, you know, you could share a meal with somebody, and then we had a little drum circle afterwards, and, and uh, you know, and, and, and it was fun. Everybody hung out, and you could visit with the speakers, you know, very approachable. And uh, second year we did it, it, it doubled in size almost tripled in size. And then uh, this year we started out and the, the second year again, it was all pretty much local you know, speakers within the state of Texas. And then the, this year we started out and uh, we got one very, you know, uh, very well-known writer and indie experiencer that said they would come and then another one and another one and another one. And we we're just like, wow, what is happening? This thing is just, it's just, it's just like had a life of its own. And right now we've got, uh, not to name everybody, but we've got Mary, Mary Neal coming. We've got Howard Storm, Jeff Olson, uh, Crystal McVeigh, Jeffrey Long, uh, Curtis Childs from the Swedenborg great. Foundation. Yes. These are great I, I think, people. I think, I, I think we've got 14 speakers. Now the 14 speakers, uh, Pam Kutcher is MD. Yes. Uh, 14 of them, uh, three of them are, medical doctors, of which two of them have had near-death experiences. We've got, uh, I think, eight of the 14 speakers are, eight or nine of the 14 speakers are uh, near-death experiencers themselves. Uh, six, of the, six of the speakers this year have, ri- have been on the best-selling, on the New York Times best-selling list. Uh, you know, and then we've got um, four, no, three or four, hospice experts we got three or four experts that are uh, research experts in uh, in the field of ndes and uh it starts on a friday afternoon at two o'clock and we've got um social mixer in the evening and then a couple of speakers howard storm and mary neal on that friday night and um that goes on until about nine o'clock at night and then on saturday we start back up at eight and we go through uh six o'clock that evening and then we have another social get together after that and then sunday we go through uh noon with the presentations and we've got a couple of workshops on that sunday afternoon but it's a combination of of presentations and workshops so you can buy a ticket to the to the all through the three-day event and you get into the you know you get lunch and breakfast and and well, you get to go nice. to social <laughs> yeah you get to go to social events and uh you get to go to all the presentations and for people that can't come to the to the full weekend, or the price might be a little bit high. We've got individual workshops, and those range in price anywhere from uh, twenty to seventy dollars. And most of the workshops are thirty or thirty-five dollars. That's great. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, but they're right. very affordable. That's great. And um, yeah, and we'll have book signings there. We'll have vendor tables there. Um, and it, it's it's a it's just a feel-good event. You know, people come, they hear these stories, they they. You know, they see that they have access to, they have access, the NDE, the people that are having the NDEs, they're not coming back with anything new. I mean, all this stuff's been around for, since the beginning of time, you know, you know, loving your neighbor and forgiveness and acceptance and connectedness and 
service. All these things are old messages. The the NDE just brings a a, a new awareness to it, and and you know the speakers share those messages. They share how they've integrated these things into yes. their lives, and and it, and it's for the general public to see how anybody, any one of us, can can uh, integrate these things into our lives and make them a part of our lives and improve your life and improve the lives of the people around you. It's 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 a it's an uplifting man you know message for for humanity. Right, and I it's interesting because I've been to several different things that are afterlife related, and I have left there with some of the best friends that I have in life. You get like-minded people interested in the same thing, and you just never know. I mean, I encourage people to if you're traveling single, still go if you don't have anybody that'll travel with you. Um, you know that. You just never know who's sitting at your left or your right or your breakfast table or your lunch table. It's amazing, and I know. Not. Yeah, we're we're an interesting group. The those of us that love um, the stories and the research on the hereafter, near death experiences, afterlife, and things. Because I think, like you, hearing these messages, learning these things, they help us live a fuller life, a life of service, a life of making a difference, or, you know, these simple things that matter, whatever those little things are, it, it makes a difference, but it gives us value to our life. Yes, and the message is for all of us, mm-hmm. for everybody. It's not, it doesn't ex- exclude one single person walking the face of this earth. Right. This is all, this is all about love and togetherness and connectedness and, and, and what we can do for each other, you know. How could how could anybody not want to live that life? Yeah, and I think too, Pat. You know, there's different. There's so many different stories that have happened that I've heard. I've interviewed a lot of people that have had the near death experiences, and they're different stories with a lot of common themes. But you know, some people, you you know, you might have seen the light through the glass and the souls, and some people have seen deceased loved ones, and I mean, different. There's so many. I think you know, not any human being. Um, I mean, there's many different experiences as there are probably people living this, this earth. Um, but each one of them matters and you can be so inspired about us being souls, having a human experience about what our life is for and also have the comfort that this life is just part of a, a much bigger whole. Yeah. And, and I think, I think things like, like the, the symposium, they, I mean, we we know the lessons, we know the messages. Everybody knows. Most most of your major religions are based on mm-hmm. on on these on these themes. But when you experience it with other people, or you know something like the symposium, it inspires you. It makes you more aware of them, and it and it and it takes it from you know it helps you take it from a thought. A, a thought or a, or a feeling, and and it gives it legs and feet. It it inspires you to to make it active in your life. You know, right, right. And and uh, and we need that from each other. You know, mm-hmm. we need to inspire each other. Mm-hmm. And uh, that's the that's the fuel that we need to run on. You know, I do. So it, it's uh, yeah, yeah. Like you said, when you go to one of these events, uh, you're surrounded by like-minded people that sure. want to make things better and it's a battery recharge you go out the next day oh, absolutely to work with a with a little pep in your step and and it and it's it's inspirational to the people that you run into after that and mm-hmm. you know i've i've had some people that went to the well one guy in particular that was there last year at the event and uh and he has a blog on the internet and uh he said it changed his life. Yes. He was just curious to see what near death experiencers had to say. Really wasn't into it at all. And he left there and said it 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 actually changed the way he looked at things. Yes. That's great. That's great. Well, just to remind our listeners, because there's so funny, there's two symposiums in 2018. Um, there's the Afterlife Symposium, September in Scottsdale, which is afterlifesymposium.org. But what we're talking about is the wisdom of the near-death experience, which is held at the Omni Austin Hotel, South Park, correct? 
Yes. 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 I'm, I'm and reading uh, about it. Texas Symposium. A little confusing on the website. The event is called Wisdom of the Near Death Experience. Mm-hmm. Website to go to get information off the website. It's neardeathwisdom.com. Near death wisdom dot com. Near, near near death death com. Yeah. Right. And if you are sitting at home, a listener, uh, and this appeals to you, I mean, if I had those dates free, I'd be there in a heartbeat, maybe next year. Um, but this is March 23rd, 24th, 25th in Austin, Texas. Just an airplane ride or a drive away. But if it, this is something that sounds interesting to you, I tell you, and this, I'm talking to the listener here, there are times that I've had doubts about things to do, and then sometimes I just go for it, right? I don't know how it's all going to work out, but I book a ticket and just go for it. And just the right things fall into place that I know I was meant to be there. So this might be might be something for you. Um, I'm really thrilled, and I am going to be talking to a few other of the speakers coming up on future interviews, Pat, uh, which I'm really excited because so- several of the people speaking at the um, at the Wisdom of the Near Death Experience Symposium I've met on my show, and I'm really excited to, to speak to some of the others. So I want to thank you, Pat Johnson, for being our guest today. Oh, thank you, Sandra. Thank you so much for... For helping us with the event, and thank you so much for for all the hard work that you do and spreading the messages and and the insights that you've been given and that your guests uh, share with the public. It's it's just super important, and um, you know it. And and just I want to remind everybody that's listening, you know, just to to fill your heart with love and go out there and spread it and and be aware of what's going on around you and look for those opportunities to. To, to encourage each other and to encourage other people around you. Yeah, and it all starts with the four-letter word of love, right? Love. That's it. That's right. And we got to give legs and feet to it. We got to be out there, touching and hugging and patting each other on the back and 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 uh, doing what we have to do to 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 uh, lift people up and into the. the the glowing spirits that that we all want to be. Mm. And speaking of lifting people up, I just a shout out to your friend Bobby who lifted you up and um, brought you back. And just what a wonderful friend you have. And I would be uh, honored to have a friend like that in my life sometime. So, no, oh, he is. He's, he's out there. He's, yeah, he's a lifesaver in more ways than one. Mm-hmm. Okay. Well, then in closing, uh, once again, to our listener, we've been talking to Pat Johnson, and we want to invite you to the Omni Austin Hotel South Park, March 23rd, 24th, 25th in uh, Austin, Texas. And you can find out more at neardeathwisdom.com. As always, our home base for this radio show is wedontdieradio.com, where you can find now 230 episodes that will make a difference in your life, convince you that the afterlife is real and that your life is important. Uh, Also, you can sign up for my Insiders Club and get a a healing audio called How to Survive Grief. I've got a PDF file called My 19 Reasons to Believe in the Afterlife. And it says, receive a few chapters of my book, We Don't Die, but our secret is, it's the whole book. I give you everything I've got so that you know that you are special and your life matters. So in closing, my name is Sandra Champlain, and I am so lucky I get to be your host on We Don't Die Radio. And like I said earlier, I do believe that life is an education for the soul and that your life here on earth is important. So a really warm thank you to Pat Johnson. Thank you to you for listening, and we'll see you soon.